Well, welcome everybody to the uh, latest installment in the ongoing UVA keynote lecture series out of the Department of Radiology and Medical Imaging. You can find our prior lectures on the UVA Radiology Faculty Development website. This is an extraordinary and interesting evening that we have planned for you that springs to some degree from an event that we had earlier this year, which had talked about um, when you're the target, actually, as a healthcare provider and the subject of perhaps racism by family, by uh, patients, by visitors and hospital bias and prejudice, essentially against healthcare providers. And I'm very excited that we have as our um, uh, lead presenter, uh, chairman of the department, uh, Professor Alan Matsumoto, and a wonderful panel of faculty and residents, uh, Professor Amy Taylor, um, uh, Professor uh, Tim Rooney, uh, Dr. Dara Kinarwala, um, and uh, I think we have a, a, an excellent a mix of both the didactic aspect and then some wonderful case scenarios. I want to encourage everybody who's on to use the Q&A section to be able to give your comments as we get into those discussion areas, and we'll promote them into the discussion. And with that, Professor Matsumoto, stage is yours. Okay. Hopefully, you can see my screen. Perfect. So you can hear me. So as Dr. Haskell said, I'm Alan Matsumoto, um, and I will be talking about incivility in healthcare when the perpetrator is a patient and uh, welcoming Dr. Kanarawala, Dr. Amy Taylor, and Dr. Tim Rooney, who will serve as panelists. So uh, I have no conflicts of interest related to this presentation. Although as we all continue to learn about each other, and our patients, I look forward to contributing to and learning from this session on how to be more contributory to inspiring a culture of mutual respect, trust, and civility. Because a lot of these uh, concepts not only uh, relate to our interactions with patients and patients interacting with we healthcare providers, but also just in the working environment in and of itself. So, this is interesting, uh, preventing workplace violence in healthcare. Based on data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2016, violent events accounted for about 12.2% of injuries to nurses and 12.7% of violent events to nurses per 10,000 full-time workers, which is roughly about three to four times the amount of violent events for all other occupations. You can see violence in healthcare as compared to other industries, violence in healthcare is growing faster than other industries. And then here's the, something came from Becker's, about two nurses assaulted every hour, a Prescani analysis showed, and that 5,200 nurses were assaulted in the second quarter of 2022 alone with patients being the largest source of violence. On average, two nurses were assaulted every hour based on, upon analysis of about 500 US facilities. And then more recently, this just came out, the shooting deaths of two employees at the Methodist Dallas Medical Center. Now, we will not be focusing on violence, but rather acts of incivility in the healthcare environment. So I wanna separate that as part of this discussion. We're really not gonna talk about violence, what I'd like to do is outline five fundamentals of civility, review what incivility is and the different types of microaggressions, discuss the difference between a bystander and an upstander, provide a few case scenarios when the patient is the perpetrator to stimulate a panel discussion with our panelists, and we'd like to get audience uh, input into this discussion, and then review some principles and tool phrases to use to keep in your hip pocket if you ever are around an episode of incivility. So let me outline five fundamentals of what civility is. Let's first start with respect. That is, you treat everyone in the workplace regardless of their role with respect, even those we barely know, disagree with, or dislike. Respect for others, it requires inclusivity while observing healthy boundaries and respecting yourself is key, most importantly. <clears throat> the second fundamental is awareness. Civility is a deliberate endeavor requiring conscious awareness 
of oneself and others. Self-awareness is one of the highest qualities of emotional intelligence. Mindfulness and reflective practice enhances self-awareness. Communication, civil communication is more about how we say it as much as what we say or do. Effective communication is critical at times of tension or when the stakes are high. And at this point, I'd like to refer to a quote from Maya Angelou when she says, people will forget what you said, forget what you did, but will never forget how you made them feel. And this is true in any interaction. The fourth fundamental is self-care. It's really hard to be civil when, you personally, when you're personally stressed or exhausted, distressed or ill yourself. So we all need to be aware when we need a little time to ourselves to re, uh, re, retool ourselves. And the fifth fundamental is responsibility. Understand and accept personal accountability for your actions. Avoid shifting blame for uncivil behavior, uh, behavioral choices. And intervene when it's the right thing to do. Now, I'd like to review what incivility is and different types of microaggressions. Incivility is rude or disruptive behaviors which lead to emotional and or physiological distress for the people involved and creates a sense of being disrespected and devalued. Parath, who is a, a psychologist at Georgetown, published in, mag in the journal, The Magazine about a decade ago, that when incivility in the workplace is encountered, work effort decreases by 48%, performance declines by roughly two thirds, and 78% of the employees have less commitment to the organization and 80% lose work time worrying about inc incident which was surrounding incivility. So what is incivility? This was a a paper that was recently published in AJR about six weeks ago. It's negative nonverbal behaviors, such as rolling the eyes, facial expressions, slamming doors, or frank verbal outbursts. Passive aggressive behaviors are considered uncivil, that is being rude or uncooperative, setting up a colleague to look bad or fail. <clears throat> Sexual harassment, such as unwanting touching or approaches, Inappropriate jokes is considered being uncivil. And bullying, not just the classic bullying, what you might imagine, but people in particular positions giving impossible deadlines or undesirable work to colleagues. In other words, setting them up to be miserable or setting them up to look bad or fail or creating psychological abuse. <clears throat> and frankly, insensitive or racist comments. We have to be aware of that. There's a continuum of incivility from being distracting, annoying, maybe even irritating behaviors to what is frankly violent behaviors. <clears throat> We're gonna focus on negative behaviors such as rude comments, insensitive actions, unintentional slights, gossiping, cultural biases, crude jokes, perhaps belittling comments, threats, discriminating remarks, and humiliation. We're really not going to get into the realm of physical or sexual aggression. <clears throat> now, when we talk about microaggressions, we have to really realize that many situations are ambiguous. They're open to interpretation and often challenging to recognize. Each individual in the room may interpret the same encounter very differently, depending on the context and the lens through which they are looking. There are many types of microaggressions. For instance, nurse, can you find me a doctor? That's basically a micro invalidation. It's often unconscious. It's very dismissal of the recipient's feelings, thoughts, and reality. What about, do you speak English? That's really a micro insult. Sometimes it's often unconscious. It can be demeaning about an aspect of a person's identity and I can personally attest as a medical student in North Carolina, I frequently got, where are you from? You sure speak English good for a foreigner? It was not uncommon. 
uh, I took that as an opportunity to engage with the people rather than actually taken as an insult. How about, are there any doctors from America here? There are micro assaults. These comments are often less benign, office co often, often conscious, and they're frankly old fashioned biases that are just coming to bear. <clears throat> Let's discuss now the difference between a bystander and an upstander. This is an important concept because what we're gonna come uh, take away from this, I hope, is that when you witness incivility, you wanna be an upstander, not a bystander. <clears throat> so what is a bystander? Well, you can imagine if you're walking on the street and you see someone laying on the ground and there's 50 people walking by, you may say, I'm sure they're fine or somebody else will stop or somebody's gonna call 911. I don't want to get involved. It's not my business, I'm too busy. The chance of helping a bystander when you're in a group or there's a group around is less than one in three. In contrast, if you're on, on a, a, a road and there's someone down, you're less likely to drive by them and help them. In fact, in a one-on-one -on -one situation, almost seven out of eight times, an individual is likely to stop and help. However, when you're in a big group, the silent bystander is also guilty. So try to speak out as necessary and at the timing when it's appropriate. So a bystander, in contrast to a bystander, there's what we call an upstander, someone who actually stands up, who's willing to speak up, to take, make, take action. They are a person that takes positive action, particularly when the easiest and most acceptable thing to do is nothing. It's the opposite of a bystander. We've all been in that awkward situation when we witness, frankly, incivility. And oftentimes many of us don't know what to do and we'll walk away and we'll, we'll walk uh, by a situation rather than being an upstander. So at this point, I'd uh, like to very shortly go into a few case scenario when the patient is a per perpetrator to stimulate a panel and audience discussion. I'd like to share a few more slides and then we'll go into the panel discussion. So this was uh, a group of uh, a providers from uh, private uh, practice, primary care, and they published an article talking about responding to inappropriate patients. What to say when you don't know what to say. That includes many situations in which I've encountered. Have you been on the receiving end of an appropriate, inappropriate comment from a patient or a behavior? And they asked that to faculty and to residents. And 90% of faculty have said, yes, they've been part, uh, witness to that or part of it. And residents have encountered almost eight out of 10 times. Now, interesting, in their analysis, they asked how satisfied did you as the attending or the resident feel with your response to the episode? Residents, only about one third of them said they were satisfied or very satisfied with their response. Faculty, less than 50% said they were satisfied with their response. So that means the majority of us don't really know what to do or how to manage it, or don't at least feel satisfied how we approach the situation. So at this point, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, I'd like to let us see the panel. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an artificial case scenario and I'm gonna present them to the panelists and ask them their thoughts and how that makes them feel, how they might respond. Dara is a trainee. So this is from a perspective of trainees getting treated in an incivil fashion. And then perhaps asking how the trainee, how she feels and ask how the attendings, how they may interact. And this is where we'd like the group discussion. So the first case scenario is a female trainee, like Dr. Kanarwala, has cared for a male inpatient for several days and then introduced herself as, I'm Dr. Kanarwala, multiple times to this patient. Then on rounds with the team, the patient looks to Dr. Kanarwala and says, nurse, can you get me another pillow? 
So Dara, let me ask you a question. As a trainee, how would that make you feel? How might you respond? And then Amy and Tim as attendings, if she were with you, how that might make you feel and some manners in which you would try to address this, uh, this particular scenario. Sadara. Thank you for the question, Dr. Matsumoto. Um, I think this type of interaction can be really disturbing to female physicians because the patient has set their expected terms in the interaction up in a way that adheres to historical roles um, of women in the healthcare environment. Um, and based upon the patient's inherent biases of um, what a woman's role in the environment can be. Um, and I think a comment like this can potentially be triggering to female physicians who have previously encountered gender biases um, throughout their training. Uh, more often than not, I've found when I've run into situations like this that it's, it's an innocent mistake and that can be quickly and gracefully rectified. Um, and um, that's, how, that's how usually you, Would you personally address the patient as the, the trainee, as a female physician? Yes. Um, so uh, on the occasion that this has happened, I think, well, first I make sure that the nurse didn't walk in the room behind me to make sure that you're not actually asking the nurse for a pillow. Um, and uh, secondly, I think it depends on, on a few different factors. First of all, I want my patient to be comfortable. So if they need a pillow, then someone needs to get them a pillow. And um, I think in situations like this, if, if I were feeling triggered, then the most helpful thing to do, I think, is to step outside of oneself and to reflect on um, how I'm feeling um, and then decide maybe, okay, I, maybe I need a little bit of a walk to go get the pillow and come back and make sure my patient is comfortable and then sit down, introduce myself. And sometimes using different words are helpful. So I'm Dr. Kanarawala, medical doctor. I'm the physician taking care of you. Um, and, and I think that patients in, in this environment, I mean, you know, they're sick. They haven't been sleeping very well. They haven't been resting very well. They're kind of in the they're going through a lot. So I think that it's easy to, for, for them to revert um, to unconscious biases that can exist even if they have the best of intentions. And so giving them the benefit of the doubt is, um, is the most helpful thing that we can do in order to, um, in order to teach, in order to help, help um, people open their minds and not feel bad. Dr. Taylor, Dr. Rooney. Your thoughts as the attending? Yeah, so I I have also experienced this um, as Dr. Kanarawala has um, in real life. And I think, um, especially if you're in a big group situation, it can feel very belittling. It can feel like you did something wrong. Like maybe you didn't explain your role very clearly to the patient the last 5,000 times that you've seen him or, um, you know, something like that. And it just kind of makes you feel very small, I think, especially as a trainee um, with other people around. But I think that um, as an attending, if I saw that happen to, to Dr. Kanarwal, I think I would say to the patient, you know, we would be happy to get you a pillow. This is actually Dr. Kanarawala. She's one of the doctors taking care of you and has been taking care of you for the past several days. Um, you know, if you also need your nurse for something um, other than a pillow, we'll be happy to, to find your nurse as well. Um, and that's kind of how I would, would probably try to do that so that it's not confrontational, but just sort of clarifying. Dr. Rooney, your thoughts? Yeah, in these kind of situations where, um, you know, I've experienced this with a, a female trainee, perhaps, um, and I have certainly, um, my first thought is always um, to, you know, to align and protect the trainee because it's so, um, it, it's, you know, because I perceive that um, this sort of the group effect that Amy was talking about, that kind of belittling effect, and I would really worry about that. And so I hope that I've already established a relationship and with the trainee where I feel like I can support them. And then so if we do step out of the room, then I can really, you know, talk to them on the level, on a, an equal level so that we can really kind of, I can understand how she's feeling. Um, and that's something that, uh, 
that I've tried to do in the past is sort of the debrief concept if we decide to handle it in that fashion. And I always want to be to have the, the professional relationship with the trainee so that I feel like I can do that effectively. Um, I'm, we're not just kind of coming into this, the, you know, for the first time. And so um, finding out what, you know, what the trainee is about and finding out um, what the situation is doing, um, you know, to the trainee at that problem at that point is really important, I think. So, so doc, Dr. Kanarawali, uh, Kanarawala, um, Dr. Tim sort of suggested not only recognize it happened, but maybe a debriefing session. You as a trainee, Dara, how, what would you hope you're attending in terms of having your back or sort of take, making sure you're okay? What would, you, what would you, what would make you feel better or feel as if they have your back, so to speak? Mm -hmm. I think that I, I really appreciate the intent, Dr. Rooney, of, um, of debriefing and of having a conversation about this after the fact. Um, I do think that um, depending on the circumstance, it can be helpful to do with the other trainees or with the other female trainees, with the other medical students, um, uh, or if there's something more egregious, then perhaps uh, a, a more one-on-one -on -one session. I also think that it can be um, it can be helpful because as trainees and students, we are being evaluated by our attendings whose viewpoints on these matters and his own um, unconscious biases, inherent biases may not be known to us. And in an effort to be well liked by all of our teachers to um, to do well on, on our services, um, to make sure that we're getting done what we need to get done. Um, we, we might allow for more misbehavior on the part of the patient. Um, and this can ultimately for female trainees and minorities would lead to cycles of self-doubt, um, a sense of overall unfairness, um, uh, even resentment and disengagement in the worst case scenario. Um, I think that in certain cases, even approaching it up front before something egregious happens, um, or even before something like this, which I would consider um, relatively relatively minor or innocent, but something like this happens, just so that if it happens to someone while you're not watching, um, the trainees know where they stand um, in that uh, learning environment. Hey, Zeeb, are, are we getting any questions or suggestions from the chat or? Uh... Uh, we're, we're, we're getting uh, comments of emphasis of people have experienced this as well, either as foreigners or otherwise at all levels of training. Uh, I think, I think this, this message, you know, as a, as a now um, long senior professor with perspectives similar than you, this is, you know, these are relatively recent concepts to, to folks like us that, um, have been practicing for a long time and and may not be as sensitive as we need to be to these kind of unequal power dynamics that Dara is mentioning, where um, we might be prepared to blow it off as perhaps medical naivete on a patient, or you don't have enough time to sort of figure them out, or you're trying to kind of get around their acute illness. And, um, and sometimes in that setting aren't necessarily as attuned as we need to be, unless we have this kind of constant reminder of we have this role to be in the meta of the situation as well, particularly in a supervisory or senior role to be looking at that interaction, um, you know, both for education for patients, but also for education and concern for the other people at different levels in the room than us or colleagues who may simply not necessarily be comfortable to speak up. So that is that bystander effect that or a bystander role that really requires some scripting, which is, I think, what you're what you're also emphasizing with us tonight, which is you have to kind of have it prepared, not afterwards when you're going up the stairs and saying, oh, I wish, or somebody tells you. Um, One of the things that I thought um, that, that uh, Dar brought up so um, effectively is that um, we, um, the power dynamic is so in, innate in our interaction and the sort of pleasing effect that we do in medicine, it's so important um, to us. And I think one of the things, sort of that concept of doing things away from being seen, where creating that 
comfortable space where the power differential can be ratcheted down so that the trainee knows up front that you know we're ally we're allies here and that's super hard but i think it requires kind of a 24 7 surveillance um which zeeb i think is is sort of alluding to i guess i guess one 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 question perhaps y'all can reflect on for me which means sometimes in that setting um you're not sure whether you can how much you can educate the patient and yet how important is we do it there at that moment or that we step out and we acknowledge to that other person whoever that is i know that that's just happened mm -hmm. um was that adequate i may not have spoken in the moment you know having that kind of conversation afterwards that may not be as effective but i wonder how we modeled that as well if we weren't sort of ultra present in that second okay let, let me go to another case scenario uh this is a, an asian american trainee <clears throat> it could be me a few years ago i meet a new patient who I, who is a caucasian i go in i say hey i'm dr matsumoto i'm going to be your your uh, resident doctor taking care of you and the patient says great to meet you doc where are you from and i tell them i'm from California, they say, no, no, where are you really from? And then I say, well, <clears throat> my family, well, I was born in Salt Lake City, my, but my grandparents were from Japan. And the, and the person says, gee whiz, your English is pretty good for a foreigner, okay? And Amy, you know, you're, you're my attendee. And <clears throat> not only that, you're the associate residency program director for the independent IR pathway, and I'm an independent resident. And so you're my attending and Anna program director. So how would you necessarily handle that situation if this occurred, if I just sort of just let it go? And we went on to the next patient. Yeah, so this is one of those that's um a little more, a little more overt, a little more egregious. Um, I think in the moment, I tend to try to respond sort of more with humor than anything. And so in the moment, I, I might say something sort of off the cuff, like, well, it should be, you know, he's an American or he's from California or something like that. And then kind of let that slide and, and keep going. Um, I think this is one of those situations where a debrief um, will be you know, critical sort of afterwards, like out in the hall and say, you know, um, that was uncomfortable back there. It was uncomfortable for, for me. How are you feeling about it? Um, you know, what, what could I have done to support you better? Um, or, or, or things like that, and just try to get some, some feedback, um, from you on how you feel about, about that and, and just how that made you feel. So Dari, you're the chief resident. You're up there with a medical student, let's say the medical student was the Asian student and, and you, you know, how, how would you manage it as a resident with the medical student with the patient? I do think that, you know, you've given us so many great examples, Dr. Matsumoto, of, of your experience, your numerous experiences with us in North Carolina. Um, um, uh, when you were in training and early in practice, I think that that has sort of shifted actually my um, my potential approach. I think that I would try to separate myself from what I think are the um, racial implications of what the patient is saying, and simply I realized that answering the question almost as if um, In a, not in a vacuum, but sort of, we're just having a conversation. We're answering a question and, um, you know, attempting uh, uh, unconditional positive approach to the patient in this circumstance can be really helpful um, to determine whether or not it, it's, it's, there's a negative implication behind it. We are opening up the door and, and thinking the best possible outcome of the patient and of that interaction. Okay, I, th that is uh, <clears throat> so true. We, we're in theory 
the professionals and training to be professionals. As um, you, you mentioned earlier that the patients may be in an environment that they feel vulnerable, they may be afraid. So uh, I think when I encountered it, I, I sort of took it as they were just trying to get to know me and I assumed innocence. Um, when I was wrong, I just decided those people are jerks and that's the way it is. But you know, 90 plus percent of the people were just trying to get to know me um, because maybe they'd never met an Asian person because they grew up in the hills of North Carolina and they were just interested in making conversation. Uh, much like many of us, when we started college, would ask people where they're from or what they like doing or something. So I don't know. Tim, you have any thoughts about this as a, a chief of the division? I just think there's, a, you know, and the way I think about this is, is there's just a lot of, there's tension because, you know, we're so focused on the patient. We're so patient centric and as we should be. And um, so we're, we're thinking about this positively at all times. At the same time, we have to really come at this as, um, you know, we have to create an environment that's supportive for all. So we just have to be super cognizant of where we are in this process, who we're dealing with, and really, obviously, we want to get to know the people in the room the best we can. Now, the patient is at their worst, and we can all um, say that, but we also have to, depending on the situation, depending on the body language, depending on the scenario, we have to just make the call, you know, and um, we may not always make it correctly, but we, um, being vulnerable, being open with our trainees, being respectful in our body language with our trainees, um, really looking to the trainee to um, really focusing on the positives of that person can help, um, you know, can help everyone in the room recognize the stature of that person. Um, and there, I'm, I assume there are diplomatic ways that I could handle this depending on the situation um, and try to sort of run that gauntlet as it were. Steve, anything in the chat? Any Q and A's? Um, uh, related to your next case as well, when people have made outright and racial aspects, what, um, sort of accusations. I, you know, as, a, as an older white guy, I will tell you that I've had people say to me, oh, you're one of those Jewish doctors, that's good. You know, those kinds of things. And there have been casual anti-Semitism over the year, and I'm just sort of wired to kind of blow it off um, because that's how we're put together. But that's not necessarily <laughs> that we need to, um, uh, to, to assume that everybody can sort of do this. I watched one of our senior surgeons uh, present herself a short time ago as a lady surgeon with a bit of irony. But um, she actually presented that as if to cut off um, at the outset to introduce herself that way with what I cringed a little bit to hear. And yet it was clearly some, it was clearly, I read it later as a bit of armor in which to kind of get out ahead of it right then and there, because now it's on to business. And, you know, the other side of this, not that it's the topic, is also that we have patients who are difficult and also unpleasant. And these kinds of things create difficulty for us in taking care of them too. And we've all had those patients where everybody sort of says, this is that difficult patient. And it, it, it may equally isolate them from perhaps getting um, the kind of compassionate care that we'd like to think that we can bring in every situation as well. So resolving this so that we can also do that is an important aspect of this as well, rather than having this kind of unresolved conflict um, anywhere in the team. Let me go to a third case scenario. Um, 63 year old female presents with her husband to clinic for a blood pressure follow up. The resident taking care of the patient is female and Muslim. She is wearing a hijab. Soon after the visit starts, the female patient states, I don't want a foreign doctor taking care of me. Okay. So, Tim, you're in the Mamo suite with a this female trainee, and the the woman says something like that to you before she starts undergoing the procedure, uh, and says it to your trainee. You witness that first of all. How how does it sort of make you feel, and and uh, 
how 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 do you think you address it in the moment? Well, I think that um, as a professional, um, we're going to have tons of respect for those folks who were above us, around us, and working with us. And so it, it, it's going to be startling for all of us to hear that. And um, if we're tuned in to that trainee, we're, we're really going to be startled. We're going to be, and we're, and hopefully we can respond in a way that is respectful to the trainee with whom we're, with whom we're, you know, who we're doing this. And at the same time, um, you know, not finding ways to alienate the patient. On the other hand, there are certain things that when a patient crosses a line that we do need to, you know, kind of as your talk alludes to is we do need to, to stand up directly for the, the, the trainee who's experiencing, you know, not only the power differentials we've talked about, um, but also um, this, you know, inappropriate commentary. And so we may need to have to step up and say something in a way really finding, you know, and if you can find humor in that moment, if you can find a way to um, support your trainee um, without, you know, completely sort of um, stopping the conversation, that's great. But I think I always worry that if I'm not supporting um, this person with whom I'm working, I'm not doing them a service. And so I have to be really careful here and not, um, really kind of fold, um, you know, laugh it off, or um, I really need to support that person in the moment. If I can do that in a diplomatic way, an appropriate way, then I, then I should. And if I fail that and I need to, you know, leave the room and take a breath for a minute, then that's what I need to do. And hopefully I'm in a place with that trainee that I can talk to them um, because we are aligned, because we're team members, and because that person, um, I'm vulnerable enough to that person that they can express to me how they're feeling. And we can, um, you know, we can have that kind of professional alignment, hopefully, that, you know, there isn't that secondary awkwardness between us, because we're, we're close enough that we can, you know, we have a bond and we can, we can get through this together. And, you know, that trainee doesn't, there's not a huge power differential. That trainee feels like they can be vulnerable to me as I can. And that's, that's kind of what I strive for. And that's, I thought Zeev's comment was great about getting out ahead of it, because I think that's what it's all about is getting out ahead of it so that um, we're conveying, um, we're conveying this professionalism before we ever get to that situation. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, if you want to pivot to a, a more difficult situation that has come up through the chat, a, a, a senior physician, a um, person of color who has faced situations where people have said, I'd like a Caucasian doctor. Um, you know, so for, for, from the primary care provider with specialty expertise or however they're providing that care or assigned to their care in an urgent or emergent setting, and you get that kind of head on, you know, what do we do in these kinds of situations when you face that? Amy, your thoughts, something there to Zeev's. So, I mean, yeah, that can be very awkward um, and feel very uncomfortable. Um, and, that, you know, I think in, in that kind of circumstance, you sort of have to be a little direct and, and, and say, you know, that spine, I can refer you to a Caucasian doctor. Um, however, you know, I am the, the local expert or even the, the regional or national expert on this certain disease process, um, which is why you were referred to me uh, to begin with. And, you know, the, my colleagues who, who are Caucasian are, are less experienced in, in this particular, um, in this particular disease process. Um, but it's up to you. You know, it's always your choice on on who you see. So the the other, you know, to that scenario, that was assuming if the uh, the attending was a, a person of color. Let's say it's a uh, I'm the attending, and the 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 trainee is a person of color, and the, the, my patient says that to me. How would I manage that? I would. I probably would say. Um, 
Dr. So-and-so, the person of color, is my colleague. Uh, he, he's, he or she's part of uh, our team, my team. And so uh, if you are gonna want care by our team, this person is a valuable member of our team. So let's get on with taking care of you and move forward. So how how do people how are people sure that wherever they're going to practice that hospitals also have their back because you know th those standards may vary when you get into community hospitals or smaller centers or academic centers in areas that maybe have not sort of taken the time to kind of gain this insight and you you know you feel like you might be vulnerable because people aren't going to back you because that's not the message that they want to put out they want you know just take care of anybody what what can we offer people what kind of discussion around that you know i i think that's um health system dependent but i think that's where you as a practicing physician us as a, an attending have to set our values and whether we want to be in an environment where at uva we're modeling the aspire values where we're going to be accountable, we're going to be respectful, we're going to be people with integrity and excellent. Talks nothing about person's gender, color, any of those factors, age. It's really, so I think it just depends upon you as an individual, whether you want to inspire and model those values. And if a system's not willing to support you in that, uh, belief, then I, I I would say that I would have a problem, perhaps, committing to that system. But you know, I I think um, that could be an awkward conversation you may have to have. So I think it's a fair question, but I, I think ultimately, a lot of decisions we make that we believe are for the right reasons. Uh, we individually have to stand for it, otherwise we compromise our values. So I, I don't know, Dara, you know, how would you feel if that was, you were a resident, you had a uh, African-American medical student with you and, and uh, they, they said something to that effect. Mm -hmm. I don't want that person of color in my room. Uh, that actual situation has has happened to uh, 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 one of my friends when I was a medical student. Um, the difference was that there was no one else with uh, my friend. Um, and I will say I, one of the challenges that um, that I see is that many of these events happen when there's only one person in the room. Um, I would say in my case, I have experienced comments overall, probably about 80% of the time when I'm the only person in the room. Um, and my question for you and for the um, for the entire group here is, you know, from the trainee viewpoint, our patients are also our teachers, and that's a different dynamic than when you're an attending. So the hierarchy that exists between the doctor and the patient is different compared to the resident doctor, the student doctor, and the patient. And how do we um, empower ourselves to speak up in, in that dynamic? And how does that differ from um, our future dynamic? That's a great, great question, Dara. So Tim, your thoughts on the question? We'll, we'll go around and we'll the four attendings here will answer Dara's question. Yeah, I think um, that that is, you know, that's a tough one. It is so true that this um, this power dynamic and the sort of inherent biases we have, and then you bring up this question of being alone in the room with the patient, and so you're going to act how you know you're going to react to this and there's no one there to witness this and then you're going to have your quote unquote story of this and the patient depending on the patient may have and we know how patients you know sometimes are um, sort of 
to form history. And, you know, so this is something that is, is um, gets to the very core of our values as, um, as, you know, physicians and leaders as part of a team, because, you know, how do you feel when, when I'm not there? And how is that patient different when I'm not there? And then how do you express that given all the other things that you've wisely said about those relationships and how those power differentials set up? And so while there's no easy answers, we would hope that our um, ethics would be, um, you know, rock solid, that we would, you know, that it wouldn't be about um, pleasing and it wouldn't be about, you know, the sort of apprenticeship of medicine, but it would be about you right now, who might be able to teach me right now, um, you know, the, um, a very appropriate way to handle this. Tim, so this echoes uh, um, some comments that we've gotten in the chat as well about remembering that um, when you, you know, you're higher up on the sort of the medical food chain as the attending down, that you sort of set the values that hopefully inspire people in the team. And this can be done on an institutional level, but this really is sort of, to my mind, a local experience. You know, there's the, the sort of the saying that you're, the, you're a mentor every day until one day you're not because you behave out of acceptable behavior. But you essentially sort of maybe have to say to people that you work with at the outset, which is these are the values that I uphold and then figure out ways to demonstrate them and encourage people to understand that, that, um, that you have their back in these settings and that if you blow it, that they can tell you because this is an ongoing educational process over here. You know, that the comment as has been brought up in the, in the chat box, which is, um, you know, um, where do you go to med school? You have a beautiful accent, which is a way of saying, you know, did you study in the US or whatever the next kind of punch around the corner is or something like that. But we, we kind of have to prepare the space for these kinds of conversations um, so that, you know, if you are in that alone situation, that there are going to be slings and arrows that you take as part of medical care training at every level, but you have a place to step out and say, somebody's got my back and I either need to talk about it with them or I understand that they have my back and this was just, you know, today's cost of doing business and how do I escalate it or where do I take it? No, but. Uh, so Amy, your thoughts. I think also that you have to remember that, you know, as Dara pointed out, um, you know, the, the patients are also, you know, the, the trainees, teachers to a certain extent, um, and that the, so there's a little bit of a different dynamic there. Um, but at, none of that overrides the fact that everyone should be treated with respect and with professionalism. And so that needs to be the foundation. Um, and so if patients are stepping over that line, intentionally or unintentionally, you know, that needs to be addressed. Um, and if it can be done in the moment without um, anger and, you know, in, in sort of a very calm um, manner and, and, and it's not confrontational, then I think that's probably the best. If, um, if the trainee is alone and is really caught off guard and just doesn't know how to handle it, um, you know, maybe just stepping out and, you know, coming to someone um, who's hopefully we've already set that set that stage that we are we do have your back and um, and you know this this is not going to reflect poorly on you and, and we'll have that conversation this is what happened this is what was said um, I didn't know how to react so I just left and you know I don't really want to go back into that room or something like that and we discuss that and we kind of break it down and then someone else can go um, address with the patient if needed. Um, or they can go together as a team. Um, but I, I, I firmly believe that, you know, at no point should, should anyone just accept being disrespected. So I encourage folks to look at the chat. There are a few folks that have made some interesting comments or other uh, scenarios that, that, or phrases that they've encountered. I think Dar, to your point, as a trainee, you feel as if you're learning from the patient, but trainees are critical members of the care team in an academic environment. So uh, I can tell you as an attending, I'm learning from my patients all the time. We always will learn from our patients. So 
just because you're learning from your patient doesn't give them the right to or be disrespectful of you. So I, whether you feel empowered to, um, to address it in person, I, I think you should feel comfortable and safe to bring it up that uh, a patient, you know, put you in that awkward position, how it meant, made you feel with your attending, your program director, or it, if you don't even feel comfortable with them, a friend and maybe talk through it and how you might want to approach it. Because I think um, that will teach you on how to address difficult conversations going forward. Because you will have those in your profession throughout your life. And the more willing you are to not just blow it off and say, oh, that person's a jerk, but rather say, well, that person may be a jerk, but in another way, maybe they need my help. And how can I step above that and provide them the help in the process, grow myself? Uh, it's not so easy. We have, we have a, a sort of a reflection on that from one of our uh, comments as well, which is that, you know, we, we're, we're talking about teaching trainees to be good doctors, but we also can teach patients to be good patients. There is no rule book for both how to be a consumer in the healthcare system and how to get what you need and not how to be passive and not perhaps get angry otherwise. But these are sometimes things that can grow out of longstanding and continuing relationships where you can build trust with somebody and then sort of teach them how to, how to be a successful patient and also teach them how to be a better patient as well. And um, that's also an important role to remember that may not happen in that acute moment, but, but, but can develop over time when you point these things out to somebody, if this happened to me with this person, who's your patient? And I view that as a challenge or an opportunity also. Yeah. And so what I'd like to do now is in the last five to seven minutes, uh, go ahead and review some principles and tools and phrases you can keep in your hip pocket if you should ever encounter in incivility. Are you able to see my slides again? Go ahead and share now. Okay. All right. Okay. Almost, it's, but not yet. Not yet. How about now? Excellent. Okay. So how do we approach these uncomfortable scenarios, really, and keep things balanced? I, I want to use a quote here from Ted Lasso from Apple TV, be curious and non-judgmental. And you heard Dar in our, the first case scenario, I, I don't, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay. 80 to 90% of the time, that will get you over the hump. And for those other 10 to 20% of people that are just jerks, maybe you have to work with them a little harder. This article that came out from uh, Dr. Tam and Diaz Ochu from the Department of Pediatrics at Utah, they talk about how to approach this. And first of all, when this happens, check your own reaction. But to this end, they, this other uh, author from the AAMC News said, just because the behavior can be explained doesn't mean it should be tolerated. So here are some phrases that, that came out of this article from Tam and Diaz Ochu that said, you know, what did you mean when you said, I'm worried that your comment gesture was very uh, dismissive of my trainee. Or I'd like to understand your perspective of why you feel that way. So for the person put it in the chat box, it says, someone says, I wanna know where you went to medical school. That may be something I'd like to understand your perspective and you can have a conversation. And why they're educating you about how patients feel and how they have biases, you can provide some education to the patients as well. Occasionally, you may need to refocus the discussion to the professional context. Having a predetermined script, as Zeev had mentioned, was, is important. Such as saying, you may have been trying to compliment or joke, but didn't, wasn't received that way. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, willing, I'm willing to come back and discuss this further a little bit later, but let's move on to your medical problem and I'll come back and talk with you about this other issue. It is important to debrief, as Tim mentioned, 
this is a traumatic event, not only for the person that experienced it uh, in civility, but for those that witnessed it and feel a little bit helpless, like, what do I do? Offering support, resources, and a chance to talk are very important to assuring a, a better outcome. Uh, I, I think timely mitigation, maybe after you walk out of the room, let's meet at 10 o'clock when we're done with rounds. And I want to talk about what, what just happened because it didn't seem fair to me. I, I want to see how you're doing. And at the time of debriefing, you can ask, how did you feel it was handled in the moment? What can I do as an attending to better support you? Because I'm learning how to do this as an attending while you're learning as a trainee or as a colleague on how to manage that emotion. Now, most of the faculty went through this BEGIN framework. This is an acronym using mindful techniques where you use breathe, just take a breath in, Always mind and be mindful of being empathetic. You heard Dara say at the very beginning, the patient is here, they're under awkward conditions. You may have to set up some goals, again, inquire and then engage with the patient. So with the begin, begin framework, you start with empathy. You know, trying to understand the patient's point of view, even if you were treated uncivil, and we're frankly insulted, but recognize you're the professional and you have the opportunity to educate the patient uh, and try to get on to take care of the patient. So you take a breath, calm yourself. Again, to Ted Lasso, suspend judgment and prepare for the conversation. And maybe you're coming back and who's, who should be in the room? It's gonna be me and the attending or just the attending alone, a whole big group or just, one person. The conversation, when you begin with empathy, you can start out, it must be really tough being in the hospital or not feeling well when I know you, you're you used to being an active person. You want to state the goals and dollars clearly. We treat each other, our patients with respect, and therefore we ask you to treat our team, all members of our team with respect. You ask a curious question. Again, be inquisitive rather than judgmental. So help me to understand, what did you mean by that comment? Please let me answer any questions. And then engage them towards the goal, which is to help in their care. So now that we've had this conversation, or I'd like to come back and talk to you about that comment you just made, but let's get on with the business and take care of you first, and I'll come back and talk to you. So some of these phrases help me understand how can we assure that this doesn't happen again to one of our team members because uh, it just was not very comfortable for me as the physician in charge. So I want to go over and just review the five fundamentals of civility. First is respect for others and particularly for yourself. Being aware of the situation, but your own feelings and your self-awareness. Make sure to communicate effectively, even if you have to step away and not necessarily do it in the moment, but when you can sort of regroup. Be responsible and accountable, and importantly, take good care of yourself, because if you're exhausted, and I know this for a fact with myself, when I'm exhausted, I'm very short, and I don't process things as well as at other times. Be an upstander, not a bystander. Don't allow your mouth to become locked in the jaw-dropping open position when you are stunned by what happened. That's what Tim Rooney basically said. It's sort of like everybody's aghast. You're sort of like, what do I do? It's sort of like, that was unbelievable. But you can't let it go. Try if possible and respond in real time. And if you're not prepared to do so, let the patient know and the person to whom was treated in, uncivil like that let's get together and debrief. Have the courage to model positive behaviors yourself, making sure you, that you don't inadvertently create an uncomfortable environment, even though you think you're being funny or joking around. And as uh, Rez Dockerty's, one of his favorite 
Character Sulu, George Takai said, we should indeed keep calm in the face of difference and live our lives in the state of inclusion and wonder at the diversity of humanity by being curious and not judgmental. So I, I think that these are some of the uh, scenarios that we went through. I wanted to provide you some terms about different types of microaggressions. Raise your awareness that sometimes what may not bother me or someone else may bother someone, uh, 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 a, a trainee or a colleague or a faculty member and just get a sense of the tone of the environment and, and just be aware and be an upstander uh, and try to uh, ensure that the trainees in particular or junior colleagues feel safe coming to you if they feel they've been put in an awkward situation. And again, I wanna thank Dara and Amy and Tim for serving as panelists. And, uh, uh, and thank you for those that submitted questions and thoughts or comments. I wanna echo that and thank all our panelists and thank all our uh, uh, um, program coordinators who've helped put this together and our audience. And um, I hope you have a wonderful evening and have left with some practical tools and tips that you can use even this week in your practices and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everybody.